Hey guys, this is Srini and in this video, let's have a look at how we can easily put together a few lines of code for sign language classification. And this is based upon MNIST uh, dataset that we'll see in a minute. And the reason I'm doing this video is a few of you really asked for this, uh, even though I've done a few of uh, classification, especially multi-class classification videos in the past, but it doesn't hurt to learn in different ways. So this is a classic multi-class classification algorithm and this should be very easy even if you're new to python relatively new to python you have to understand the basics this is something you should be able to easily put together and especially this data set can be very useful if you plan on experimenting with uh, models how you're going to put together some models and uh, how your uh, let's say drop off rate for example affects the outcome and uh, stay tuned for the next video where I'm going to talk about, okay, you have four, five, six different models that you're experimenting with. How can you actually uh, combine the results from all of those into an ensemble output? Because ensemble is always better than a single model. But for now, let's go ahead and focus on solving this problem, which is, uh, I hope you'll find this to be very easy. Uh, and a uh, quick note here, uh, even though each alphabet, each English alphabet has a sign in sign language, including Z, the MNIST data set, I don't think it has a Z, we'll verify that in a minute, because all of these other ones can be easily uh, interpreted using a single image, but Z or Z, if you are not from US, uh, this uh, includes a motion that, that shows Z, you know, the shape of Z. So this is not interpretable using a single image. So that's probably why they haven't included this in uh, the MNIST data set. Now let's jump into the code right away, and then I'll try to explain every line, but by not uh, belaboring all the simple points. So let's jump into the code, okay? Okay, so uh, here we are. Again, I'm using spider IDE because it makes it very easy for us to explore the variables up here while we are uh, changing the code here. And let me also zoom in this uh, IPython console so you can see the output in an uh, easy way without me zooming in digitally every time. Now, uh, for the data set, you can go ahead and download the data set uh, from uh, Kaggle. I mean, I, uh, I'll include the link as part of the description and uh, we'll see how the data set looks like in a minute. In fact, when you download the zip file, you, you'll have like a few of these and the only two things that are useful, well, that we'll be using are these two. One is MNIST test and the other one is train. As the name suggests, this one contains the test uh, data, this one contains the train data. And how can a CSV file contain the data? Let's go ahead and open it to understand what this is. I'm opening this in Notepad++, so everything is not really that organized. If you have Microsoft Excel or something, that's fine. Go ahead and open it in there. Now, let's go back to the top and look at uh, the labels, the, the titles, right? The first column has the label, and the label goes from 0 to 24 representing all 25 alphabets and the 26th one, the Z, we don't have it here, okay? So the label goes from, you see, 6, 5, 10, 0. 0 is basically A, right? I mean, you go from A through uh, uh, Y. And you see, you'll find like some of these 24s, uh, 22, uh, but you'll not find 25. <laughs> okay, and wh what's everything else? So the first one is label and everything else is pixel values, right? So you have pixel one, pixel two, pixel three, and how many of these do you have? I believe if you keep going, it has a pixel 784, right? So that's the last one, which means we, total, we have 785 columns in total. The first column is just the label and remaining 784 represents the image. Why 784? Because these are all 28 by 28 pixel images and 28 times 28 is 784. Okay, so we're all set. Now you understand the background of this. Okay, so let's see how we can get the data ready. Obviously, it's very easy. It's all in CSV files, so we can just load it from these files. So let's go ahead and load the required libraries. And again, uh, pandas, so we can handle, uh, you know, data frames, data as, uh, 
you know, uh, as an Excel sheet, for example, if you read uh, CSV, this is very good library, NumPy to handle, to work with numbers, uh, random, so we can kind of pick random number and then plot uh, random images in the uh, in middle using PyPlot. And I'm using two categorical, I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, to convert uh, the, the labels into one hot encoded because this is multi-class classification problem. And then from Keras, we are using sequential and con2D max pooling, so we can put together our own uh, neural network. Okay, so with that understanding, let's uh, get down to uh, loading the data set, right? I mean, we are using pandas to read the CSV file. Let's read both train and test CSV files. And let's look at variable explorer. You see how it's a bit slow because these are large files. And test, let's go ahead and do train and test. So if you look up here, our train has 27,455 rows and 785 columns. We know that the first column corresponds to label and everything else is pixels that defines our image. Same thing with test. We have 7,172 of these uh, and same number of columns. Okay, so now first of all, let's convert this data frame into a NumPy array. So it's easy for us to handle, okay? So I'm converting everything, including the first column. You can separate the first column and save it as Y, everything else as X. It's up to you how you would like to handle, but this is this is basically how I'm handling it. Okay, when you look at your train data again, uh, we didn't do anything yet. We just converted our uh, pandas data frame into a NumPy array, right? So now I'm actually defining the class names as A, B, C, D all the way through Y. Remember, we don't have Z. Why? Because when I plot it or when I have a quick look at, uh, you know, uh, the images, I'd like to convert my 0, 1, 2, 3s into A, B, C, D. So it's easy for us to interpret. OK, so that's why we are reading uh, the class names. Next, this is where the random comes into picture. So I'm just uh, generating a random number between one and whatever the shape is, like 27,400, right? And uh, basically plotting that image. And for that, I'm getting the values all the way from one and above, right? Column number zero, we don't care. We care about the remaining 784 ones and reshape them into 28 by 28 so we can see them as an image. Okay, that's exactly what this line is doing. And basically I'm printing the corresponding label for that specific image. So let's go ahead and run these lines to have a look at it. And there you go. So this apparently is a T right there. And let's print it one more time. So randomly generate something else, that's a B. That's an X, I, I mean, I don't know what this is. I mean, we, I guess we know the victory sign, right? So that seems to be corresponding well. Uh, R, and let's look at a couple more. Yeah, A, so this is something I'm familiar with. Q, I don't know, but A, uh, L, uh, uh, you know, we know that is L. So everything seems to be fine, right? I do this no matter what data set I work with to make sure everything is, you know, uh, correct. And now we can go on to the next step. Okay, now I'm a bit curious about how the data is distributed. How many of my, uh, how much of my data corresponds to A and B and C and D? Sometimes you have data that's not balanced, right? So I always, always try to do this. Like look at how the uh, classes are distributed. So here again, I'm just looking at the label and then value counts, right? So, and do a uh, bar plot. So it's basically a histogram plot of, or a frequency plot, right? Of how many of these uh, labels are A's and B's and C's and then I'm just setting the label, that's it. Nothing, again, nothing tricky. We do this in, if you're a regular follower of my channel, we do this in almost all the, uh, you know, uh, videos. So let's go ahead and see. That is a very nicely balanced data set. I mean, there are more of 17s. I should have labeled them as ABCs, but this is fine. I just want to see if it's balanced or not. Yeah, looks like on average we have uh, anywhere between, uh, what is this, 900 to 1200 you know, data and uh, labels four, one and seven, the least represented labels 17, 16 and 11, uh, the most represented. But I don't worry about, at this point, I don't wanna worry about balancing the data because we seem to have a good balance, okay? That's the point of that. Now, if you look at our, X, um, I mean, our training data, this is, uh, these are all values six point, 149 point, but then the values are going from zero to 255 because uh, these are all uh, originally 8-bit and we never converted them into like a true float where the values go between zero to one, right? So let's go ahead and normalize the data, okay? So uh, 
well, I'm scaling the data. I'm just dividing my training and testing by 255 and assigning it to a variable called X train and X test. So let's go ahead and do that X train and X test. So now you have your X train and X test all floating point 32 values going between zero to one, uh, almost ready. Now we need to do uh, our Y train. We need to get our Y train ready, right? Again, what is our X train in our training data, uh, which is a NumPy array? all the values going from one and above, right? Because the zeroth column is basically our uh, label. That's exactly what we do for our Y train. Y train is uh, exactly uh, the zeroth column from our training data. That's as simple. So when I run that, you should see that my Y train, if I can open it right there, I don't know why it doesn't let me open, but if you look at the Y train values there, they're basically three, six, two, eighteen, 18, and so on, right? So these are, uh, you know, the alphabets, these are the numbers going between 0 to 25. Now, if you are using XGBoost or Random Forest or, uh, you know, uh, any gradient boosting or traditional machine learning, this is fine, having values between 0 to 25. For deep learning, especially if you want to use categorical cross entropy, okay, uh, then, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll probably talk about that later on, but if you want to use categorical cross entropy as a loss function, then you need to convert this into categorical, which is one hot encoded vector, right? So uh, uh, when I do this one hot encoded, you'll see that my Y train categorical basically says zero, zero, zero all the way. Uh, again, please watch my tutorial on one hot encoded. I don't want to take up too much of your time explaining things that I've already explained in the other tutorial. So it's one hot because in a given row, only one value has a value of one, everything else is zeros. And what value has a value of one? It's whatever corresponding to that specific label. If the label is five, then the fifth column or the fifth value will be one, everything else will be zero. That's what two categorical actually does. So let's do the same for our testing data set, okay? testing and believe it or not this classification is as easy as it gets this is very similar to your mnist digits data set except now we are just looking at the sign language okay but it's worth covering this in case you are uh, you know interested in learning uh, or practicing the classification especially multi-class classification uh, so uh, now uh, our x train is what? What is the shape of our X-train? It's 27455 by 784. We have to obviously uh, change the shape of this so we can uh, provide this as input to our neural network. So the way I change this is we have 27,455 by 28 by 28 by 1, right? So the central two are the image X and Y dimensions. The last one is the number of channels. These are all uh, grayscale, so the number of channels is 1, and we have 27,455 total images. Let's do the same even for test. Okay. All set with data preparation, and this part is the fun part. So now let's actually start creating some models. I'm going to show you only one in this video. In the next video, let's create three models and see if we can combine the results from these three in enhancing the experience even better, in enhancing the accuracy even better. But for now, let's just do one model. What I'm doing here is just using the sequential method in Keras, uh, starting off with convolutional 2D, 32 uh, units, 64 units right here, and then 128 units, and I'm doing max pulling and dropout, like 20%. Uh, even with this dropout, maybe I should change this to like 0.3 or something. You'll see that uh, this may be a bit of there may be a bit of overfitting, uh, but we'll see that. I don't know. I don't want to guess. But the most important thing: flatten the layers before it goes to dense. Right? I mean, dense can only handle these vectors and uh, number of units. And finally, the output layer, which is a dense layer, is giving 25 outputs. Each output corresponds to a specific alphabet that we are trying to predict. And since we're using softmax as the activation function, the output is going to be a probability where when you add the probability of all of these 25 outputs, the, it, it should be equal to one. Meaning when we get this 25 outputs, we will be picking whatever the maximum one probability is. And we are going to make that the classification for this, for this specific prediction. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. If you have three different things, cat, dog, or an elephant, right? If I get like cat as 0 0.1, uh, dog as 0 point, uh, you know, three, and then uh, elephant as 0 0.6, then I'm saying, okay, this prediction is elephant, right? That's exactly what we're trying to do here. Okay. Now, uh, 
we need to compile this model first of all let's run these lines right i mean these lines up to here anytime you have a model you compile it with a loss function optimizer and what metrics you would like to track for that okay so let's go ahead and oh, sorry what, what am i doing there i meant to do that uh, so let's go ahead and compile this with the loss as categorical cross entropy now one note i'd like to make here is if you do not want to convert this into to categorical if you really would like to work with 0 1 2 3 as your classes then you still can work except instead of uh, categorical cross entropy as the loss use sparse categorical cross entropy as the loss okay that's the only difference so for now let's see you compile it with categorical cross entropy optimizer as adam you can try uh, stochastic gradient descent and something else and metrics i'm using accuracy okay for metrics so let's go ahead and run this and report the summary of my model right so the final layer is going to report 25 outputs and each one is a probability like i already mentioned now let's go ahead and fit this and uh, let's do 10 epochs okay so i'm fitting this to train our categorical y and with a batch size of 128 we can change that to 64 but images are so small like 28 by 28 so we can handle 128 images at the same time well i can handle it on my on my uh, system and for validation let's use x test and y test right so let's go ahead and run this this should be relatively fast i hope because i'm using a uh, gpu in this case even if it's not gpu this should be usually not that bad maybe uh, instead of eight seconds about 40 to 50 seconds per epoch and as you can see even after the first epoch the uh, accuracy is 52 percent and 73 percent right there so this is a relatively straightforward data set now while this is running one thing i'd like to mention please try this by extracting features and using LGB, uh, you know, uh, LGBM or uh, I'm forgetting things, a couple of these gradient boosting algorithms and also random forest and see if you can get good accuracy. Uh, for these type of data sets, for these type of classifications, especially if you have 25 different classes, my experience is uh, these type of neural network approaches are uh, preferable and uh, i have uh, done some comparison between okay random forest and of course if you tune your hyperparameters uh you know with random forest or xg boost you may get very close but this is the easiest way to implement uh using deep neural networks for these type of applications especially okay so we are on our 10th epoch and it's uh, we are getting 97 percent accuracy that is uh, actually validation accuracy of about 94 percent that's not bad that's pretty good actually given that i literally didn't think too much about putting this network together uh maybe if you add something maybe if you tune this even more you know you may get better accuracy but let's leave it right there um, let's go ahead and plot our training and accuracy i mean the loss and accuracy so there you go so this is not bad actually i mean i can see a bit of overfitting going on right there because you can see how the training loss is still getting better but then the uh, validation loss is kind of going up this is a classic sign of uh, a bit of overfitting and say so same thing is reflected down here now i recommend you to change the dropouts to maybe add a dropout somewhere here change the dropouts to like 30 percent like instead of 0 0.2 change it to 0.3 and see if that helps in terms of regularizing or uh, minimizing your overfitting well when you do increase your dropout that's a way of regularizing right okay so now you have this let's go ahead and predict it how do we do that we have a model let's go ahead and predict the uh, uh, model dot predict okay so now we predicted on all of our 7000 uh, images uh, 28 by 28 images and now let's go ahead and compare that prediction against the true which is our y test and print the accuracy score we know this this is 73 point something right i mean sorry 93 point something okay we got an accuracy score of 93.8 almost 94 that's good now let's see a few images so here again i'm picking random images from our our test data set and then looking at what is the true and what is the predicted okay this is always a fun exercise to do so there i should have plat plotted this in a smaller size but uh, again the more important thing is okay predicted as y true label is y let's see if we can catch any wrong ones again y uh, i true label is i a o yeah i guess i guess we can do this all day oh here, there you go so v and u are i don't know what the sign is for v but this looks like 
V to me, right? I mean, this looks more like V. So even if humans can actually make this mistake, I'm not surprised that uh, the, the computer is making that mistake. And if both signs look very similar, uh, in the sign language, then uh, this is totally understandable why this is confusing between these two. In fact, later on, let's go ahead and plot what alphabets are uh, wrongly classified the most. Okay, that way we can we can uh, do certain investigation. Okay, now instead of just pl plotting each of these, let's uh, uh, plot a confusion matrix again. Uh, confusion matrix. You can import it from scikit-learn metrics and confusion matrix is basically looking at how many classes you have, how many classes of those are correctly identified and wrongly identified. And if it is wrongly to what class is it wrongly identified, right? So let's go ahead and plot it so you understand exactly what I'm talking about. So uh, uh, Seaborn is a great library for uh, plotting these type of plots. I, sh I can actually increase the figure size to get this a bit better, but you can see uh, you know, this is A, B, C all the way. And then uh, uh, some of these probably use and V's are a bit wrongly classified right there. So that's a nice visual representation of what's doing, you know, where the confusion is and all that. OK, so this is good. Now, uh, this is too busy because we have 25 classes. So what I've done here is I'm just looking at which ones of these are incorrectly classified, what percentage of these are incorrectly classified. And we are going to plot this again. Don't worry, I'm going to share the code. Look down under the description uh, for my GitHub page and you can download the code. So hopefully you aren't wasting time trying to write down stuff that you see here. OK, so apparently we're doing great with A, B, C, D, E, F. G seems to have some issues right there. So we got like more than about 10, 12 percent of G's wrongly classified. Uh, about 4% uh, of H's, but then um, U and V is V. So it looks like all V's are correctly classified, but U's are wrongly classified, uh, some of these. The ones with the most, uh, uh, almost 30%, like 27, 28% of Q's are wrongly classified as something else, okay? So uh, this is, again, you can continue this analysis if this is your field and if you really would like to build something, obviously you have to dig a bit deep into why this is happening and how you can fix it, okay? So again, this is a quick tutorial. As you can see, I mean, it's 20 minutes, but uh, please stay tuned for the next one because I really would like to uh, build on what we learned here, add a few more models, okay? And uh, improve the accuracy even further by combining all of these models together okay so thank you very much for watching this uh, video and again please hit the subscribe button and the like button because i know you love this video thank you